Okay, everybody, today we're joined by Mike Codella. He is a former New York City narcotics officer. He's the author of the book, Crime, Punishment, and the Battle for New York's Lower East Side, along with Bruce Bennett, I believe, was the co-author with you there. Yeah. Okay, he's a uh, born in Canarsie. That's where he grew up. And uh, he's also a third degree black belt under Master Henzo Gracie, which is, for any of you that don't know, that's pretty impressive qualification. We'll, we'll talk about that later also. Um, so Mike, before we start, you know, cause I've been listening to your book. It's, it's really great. It's a really good glimpse into, into New York city, um, in different eras and different facets as well, as far as you growing up in Canarsie, can you tell me about your family's roots in New York city? Cause you spoke about that. Um, specifically you spoke about your mother's uh, father, I believe. And that was a lot of interesting stuff you said about that. So if you can talk about your family's roots here in New York, I would appreciate that. Sure. My, uh, well, we'll, we'll start with my mother's father, my grandfather. Um, so he came to New York as a young guy, a young man. Uh, I shouldn't even say a young man. He was, he was actually a kid. He came over, I think when he was like eight years old, his sister preceded him. I think she, when she came over, she was like 10 years old. And then, um, they lived on the out in the low east side down off of Mulberry Street when they were when they were little. And uh when he got into his teens, he got into a little trouble here in New York. Uh with you know, Italian organized crime for whatever, however organized it was in the 1920s, let's say. And they shipped him off to he went off to Boston uh to avoid law enforcement. And then he came back when he was in his 20s and he became pretty friendly with uh, Joe the Boss Mazzaria. Mm -hmm. uh, bootlegging stuff. He, he helped out with bootlegging stuff and um, he eventually had his own speakeasy and uh, like an after hours cafe on Catherine, Catherine Street. I believe the address was one, one Catherine Street, which isn't there anymore. The building's not there. But it's literally right across the street from one police, what is now one police plaza in New York. Okay, right by the park there. They got the park there, exactly. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right uh, near the Brooklyn Bridge, the entrance to the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, in fact, him and Joe the Boss was so close that when Joe the Boss used to have sit downs or big, big uh, meetings, mafia meetings or whatever you want to call them, he would borrow my grandfather had a diamond stick pin, and he would actually borrow my grandfather's diamond stick pin, and uh, you you know to impress people at the meeting, and then he'd give it back, obviously. Um, and then, of course, everybody knows the history, or most, a lot of people know the history. Joe the Boss gets killed. And um, my grandfather was just a, not a made member or anything like that. He was just a likable guy. He owned, like I said, the cafe, the After Hours Club. And he became, Lucky Luciano knew him prior to uh, the Masseria incident. And Joe, uh, Lucky Luciano, um, became good friends with my grandfather. In fact, wow. uh, there are pictures of my uh, my uncle sitting on Luciano's lap when he was little. Wow. And uh, in fact, I'll tell you something that's really interesting. I don't think I mentioned in the book. When they took Lucky, when they took Charlie or Lucky Luciano out to kill him in, in Coney Island, after the incident, he came to my grandfather's cafe, still had the sand on him, was still bleeding from the cuts that they cut his face with. Um, and he became, like I said, he was good friends with Charlie, Charlie Luciano, and and he did some bootlegging, for, or you know, some uh, running some bootlegging for him. And then Luciano got involved with the heavy narcotics. Yeah. And their friendship kind of dissolved, and he did his own thing. My grandfather's father's the alcohol, and then from at some point he just cuts it out completely, and he works for the uh, making parachutes, believe it or not, for the war. And I okay. worked in a, like in the garment district making parachutes for the war. So you say the relationship dissolved. I mean, everyone says, oh, the mob, you know, you get killed for being involved in drugs. But we all know that's kind of bullshit. So do, do you think as far as like Italians back then that weren't involved in the mob, what do you think was their view of drugs? You think somebody like your grandfather, was that like 
no, no. That was something that many families were kind of straight away from that kind of stuff, like everyday people. Yeah, he first of all, he from what I from what I've heard throughout the family that he knew that the uh, law enforcement was you know heavy against the narcotics, and he also had I think a moral stand against it, where he felt like liquor right. gambling wasn't a big deal. Like I said, he had the after hours club on Captain Street where the guys would come and gamble and drink, and uh, but narcotics was a whole different whole different animal, so to speak, and yeah. Yeah, he took himself. He took himself out of that environment. So your father, um, he becomes a a housing cop. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. So where was he? Where was he stationed in? He worked mostly in Brownsville in East New York. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, which was back then, even really bad back then, obviously. Right. Right. So I want to talk to you about Canarsie because you grew up in Canarsie. And um, you were born in the 60s, is that correct? Yeah, early 60s. Okay, so early 60s. So let's say uh, 70s into the, let's say, you know, 1970s, that decade right there, growing up in Canarsie. And I heard that you, you mentioned that you grew up up the block from the Bamboo Lounge. Right. And so can you tell me, and you, you made a comment in my video because I said I couldn't find anything about the place being burned down in news articles or anything like that. For, for those of you who don't know, most of you do. The Bamboo Lounge um, made famous in Goodfellas. Um, they burned that place down. Can you tell me about that lounge and tell me about as far as what was going on there? You said that there was fires there, more than one. So can you, can you tell me about growing up near that spot? Yeah, so I lived like a block, um, like a block away. Um, and constantly at night, there were fire trucks going, responding to that place. And you could actually see the fires from my house. Um, and it was, and I was a kid, obviously, um, in the seventies, but it was kind of well known or amongst even the young kids that it was, uh, the fires were set, you know, that they weren't accidental fires. And literally there was a fire there. I think I exaggerated by once a month, but. Every two or three months, there was a there was a fire in there, and they didn't wow. gut the whole building. It was just enough to have fire, you know, FD come and and uh, put the fire out, and it was damaged, but the building wasn't, you know, gutted basically. Wow, yeah, I saw that it was called the Bamboo Lounge, and then it was the Regis, and then I believe it was La Park after that. But through right. that whole thing, I mean, that was always mob, right, for the most part. Yeah, it was all. Yeah, it was always. Uh, um, I'm trying to think of the owner's name. Sonny McConnick was the owner's name. Right, right. Right, and he owned it. I don't know if he owned it when it was La Park, but even whether he did or didn't, it was still a lot of wise guys, mobsters would hang out, out in it. Not, not not, as many, you know, it was, it was a different crowd. It was more of like a younger, uh, a younger crowd when it was La Park, but it was still a, a lot of wise guys, young wise guys in there. Yeah. So growing up in Canarsie at that time, it's almost impossible not to know somebody, I would imagine, that's connected to the mob or, you know, was your father friendly with anybody that was in that life being him growing up around there and being there? Was there anyone in particular that before you were a teenager that you maybe knew that your father was friendly with? Well, my father and his brother, Chicky, were good friends, actually, growing up, not so much as adults, but growing up. Um, with Vic Amuso, head of the location. Uh, mm -hmm. And especially my uncle was a really good ball player. Um, and so was Vic. And they played ball together, handball together. But baseball, uh, growing up, they were really tight and they played ball together. Uh, uh, and they, they were friendly. Actually, my uncle was friendly with Vic and, and all the guys actually that are portrayed in Goodfellas because my uncle would hang out in the Bamboo Lounge. He, yeah, uh, wow. Yeah, he, not that he was a wise guy, because he had a legit job, but he would be with them, and they would actually ask him, come on, Chicky, let's go, we're going to go do this thing, and and he would say no, and, and they would say, and I actually asked him, I said, how'd you, because uh, he was close with them, he was close with Vic, uh, he knew Henry Hill, he knew them all, because they were about the same age, and he would say, my uncle told me, basically, them guys were always in and out of jail, they were always yeah. in, in the jail, he'd say, he, He'd go to the bamboo lounge and ask for somebody, and they so he's away. They picked him up this, and the guy would be gone for three or four years. 
And my uncle was like, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to deal with that. You know, he just used to go there and hang out, drink, and hang out with his girls and that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good way to take advantage of the life without, without being in the life. It's an interesting yeah. way to be. So as far as you growing up in Canarsie, who would you say were some of the guys that you saw around the neighborhood that you say, Oh, that's that guy over there. Is there anyone in particular? And then I will, I want to talk about some of your interactions that you talk about in the book, as far as some incidents that you got into. Um, but other than that, is there anyone in particular that you would see around and you, you certainly knew who they were? Uh, well, Mickey Carrazzo. Okay. Yeah. Gambino had, guy. Yeah. He had a place on Avenue L, like a club, a little club else on Avenue L. Mm-hmm. I think it was about 92nd and L, maybe 93rd and Avenue L. Um, his brother, um, Jojo Carrazzo. Yeah. Uh, Frank Lasorino. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Canasi had a lot of wise, wise guys, and, and um, but not as many as some of these other neighborhoods. As, as uh, you know, like there was a few clubs, like the Walnut that you mentioned that you went to visit. The Walnut was Vic, Vic Amuso, of course. Uh, everyone knew, and, you know, but Vic kept a low profile. Uh, okay. Part, you know, uh, Fat Picciotto. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but these are guys that when I got a little older, well, uh, one of the guys that I actually hang out, hung out with, two of them, they were brothers. I was close with them. And their father actually owned the Walnut. Even though it was... Really? Big. Yeah. Well, we always thought his father owned it. Now, it could have been just on paper or could right. have been just in word alone and not really, not really the owner, but their father and Vic were very close. Okay. So we always understood that they owned the Walnut and that Vic and them just used the place. But, but I don't, I don't really know, like obviously who on paper owned it. Um, so when we were teenagers, late teens, you know, like 17, 18, 19, we'd hang out at the Walnut and, them guys would be there, you know, Fat Pete, uh, Lil Al Diaco once in a while, yeah. uh, Vic, of course. Yeah, I think, you know, you said that obviously there was other neighborhoods that had more of a mafia presence. But I, I don't know, for some reason, I think the thing with Canarsie, it's more of who the mobsters were that came out of that area that kind of maybe makes it a little bigger because you have a lot of brutal characters that came out of there. And I, I wanted to ask you about another crew that, um, operated in the Flatlands Canarsie area, obviously the De- yeah. the DeMeo crew. I mean, yeah. you know, specifically like let's say the Testa family. I know like Patty yeah. and, and uh, Joey Testa, and then you had Anthony Center. I mean, you must have seen those guys around. I mean, they're, they're, maybe they're about a, a decade older than you, yeah. But you must have known about those those guys. Yeah, well, I went to school with the. Uh, um, I think I went to, I, I'm not so sure always, I'm always not sure if it was a cousin or a brother, but there's actually a lot of them, a lot of, yeah. Yeah, a lot of testers. And yeah. they're a lot more related, you know, um, and I went to school with a few of them. Um, they weren't as involved as uh, like Patty. Everybody knew Patty had the car place. Everybody knew what he was up to. Uh, yeah. You know, as far as stolen cars and buying a car and getting it stolen from your house to, in the following week. Yeah. Um, Everybody, you know, everybody knew what they were up to. Um, Joey Tessa, I didn't really know. I've, I've seen him around, but I didn't really know him. Um, and Patty, I, I didn't know either, but he had dated a girl that I knew, even though she was uh, somewhat younger than him. Um, but uh, Paulie Barry was another guy from my neighborhood. He only lived a few blocks from my house. You know, wow. I, yeah. Once in a while. But... Um, like guys like Henry Hill, I didn't know, you know, I don't even know if he was in or if he was out, you know, I, I have no clue, clue uh, about him or Jimmy Burke, but, but you're right. There were a lot of notable guys that, that came out of Kanasi. Yeah. Yeah. So let's see. So now you did get involved. I mean, you didn't get involved, but you did find yourself in a couple of situations, two of them in particular that I, that I, uh, listened to from the I had the audio book I was listening to the book and uh one situation in particular you're with your friends you're outside a pizzeria and they start making trouble with the owner that comes by and he basically tells you guys to leave right. you being smart figures out you know what I am going to leave 
but your friends stay. Can you tell me about that situation and, and tell me, tell us all who that particular pizza owner was? Yeah. So it's kind of a, you know, it's, um, sometimes you get lucky in life, you know, uh, whether it was my smarts or just a little bit of luck or a little bit of both. We, it was a summer night. A lot of people were out and we were like 16, 17 years old. And, um, so we were pretty wild kids, you know, we all, we all on the same football th- high school football team. Um, we like, you know, we always were handsy with each other, like pushing and punching and that kind of stuff. Uh, and this particular night we, we were, you know, we didn't have, I think it was before any of us had a car. So we were probably like 16, 16, maybe 17. And we walk literally, sometimes we walk all over Canarsie just looking to hang out or meet, we meet up with other people. This particular night, we ended up stopping in front of a pizzeria on Flatlands Avenue. And um, I don't even think we went in for pizza. We were just hanging out, goofing around with each other. And guy, Italian guy comes out with a, like a pizza apron on and tells us to move. It, 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 not, not in a bad way, but not in a super polite way either. And we just yesed him to death. Yeah, okay, we're moving. But we don't move, you know. And then he comes out again with a little bit of a more of an attitude. Um, and again, we tell him, yeah, yeah, we're moving, we're moving. Well, he comes out one more time and now we get a little belligerent back with him and basically tell him to go fuck himself and get out of here and go, you know, fuck off. Well, at this time, we had already been in front of a place a long time, breaking each other's chops and goofing off. And I was just, me and one of the other guys were like, we're ready to go home for a night. It was kind of getting a little, not that it was so late, but it was late enough. We had enough and we were going home. And again, there were other people going in and out of the pizzeria, driving by saying hello to us. Uh, you know, all the other guys that hang out would pass by, beat the horn, stop us. And we were done. Me and my friend, one of my friends left. My other friends, the rest of us, the rest of my friends stayed. So I think it was four or I think four guys say it. And um, the guy comes out again. This time he comes out with a baseball bat to get rid of my friends. Well, like I said, my friends are pretty tough guys. And they, um, and they, my friends were pretty tough guys. When he came out with the baseball bat, they ended up taking the bat away from him. Not that that was any great feat. I mean, the guy was, I want to say probably 50 at the time. And my friends were pretty tough athletic kids. They took the bat away from him, and they beat him, beat the uh, beat the guy pretty good, basically. Uh, it turns out that the guy they beat up is Bruno Facciolo, who, yeah. you know, now I mean, a lot of people know who he was. And to be honest, we knew the name. You know, you talk about, like, guys in the neighborhood that were wise guys. A lot of them we knew by face and name. This guy, this name, we all knew Bruno. And we knew what he did and uh, what kind of life he led or what, how tough he was, but we didn't know what he looked like. Well, this right. guy who came out this three or four times was Bruno. And my friends did a number on him. And um, I was already gone, but apparently um, somebody gave the names of the people that beat up Bruno, all my friends. And my name wasn't mentioned or my friend that left with me wasn't mentioned because we weren't there at the time of the beating, luckily. And um, Bruno got 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 retribution for, for what happened. Yeah, I can imagine. So you're saying he was in an apron, so he would be there like making pizza or? You know, I, ne- I never went in, to be honest, I don't remember going in the place. So I don't know if he actually made pizza. It was his place. So maybe he went behind the counter. Who knows, you yeah. know? Um, wow. but he had an apron on, uh, and like I said, nobody knew who he was. So, so some of the guys, you know, get, uh, they end up getting beat up pretty bad for that, huh? Well, one of them, um, ended up with a plate in his head. Wow. Yeah. Another friend of mine was driving to work. Uh, I want to say a few weeks later, maybe, maybe not too, not too long later, not too long after the incident. And he was in his, uh, he did construction, so he'd get up early in the morning and he used to use the boss. The boss had given him the truck to use and he was driving, I don't know, six in the morning. He gets in his truck and he gets cut off and guys with sort of shotguns get out and they shoot up the truck. 
and they hit wow. him uh, pretty good. He don't die, but he, they they get they get they hit him uh, with the shots. Uh, another guy got he just took off. He just left. He took the mini arrow was going on. He just left for for quite a long time to avoid wow. uh, punishment. And um. Two of the, the two of the guys were set up actually by by probably Vic Vic Amuso. Okay. Because Vic had, you know, Vic was close to the family. They thought they were going to get a sit down and have everything taken care of. And on the way there, they got they got jumped by the wow. you know. Yeah. So for people that don't know, watching uh, Bruno Facciolo, Lucchese mobster. He was a powerful guy in Canarsie. I know he had a lot of restaurants. He had the pizzeria, had a big gambling operation. You know, unfortunately for him, he would get killed in 1990 by a gas pipe and a muso and those guys. But um, that's crazy story. Luckily, no, you. You know, uh, you know what's interesting about his his murder? Um, I actually, I think I mentioned it in my book when I was um, I actually was on trial for another for a drug case and. Uh, uh, I believe I was in Brooklyn, Southern uh, Brooklyn uh, Federal Court, but it might have been Southern District. I'm not sure. Eastern or Southern. Um, whoever was prosecuting Vic, uh, again, Eastern District or Southern District, I don't remember. But I was on trial uh, for a case I was doing. An under, I did an undercover on, and Vic's trial was going on at the same time. Oh wow! And I went to went to the trial when I had some downtime with my trial. And one of the days I went there, little Al Diaco, yeah. who had at some point become the acting boss of Lucchese, uh, was testifying. <clears throat> and he was telling the story of how Bruno Facciola got killed. And most people know that he got taken to a warehouse and they, they shot him and, you know, that kind of thing. But um, what was interesting, I found it very interesting, actually. Um, what was interesting was he had been uh, told by Vic and Gas to go to California and clip some guy. I forgot yeah. who. I know I've seen it, and I, I I don't remember who, but Vic and Gas had told him to go to California and clip some guy. And he brought actually a kid I went to school with, a guy named Anthony Grado, who was actually a pretty good friend of mine. He took Anthony Grado, and I think Al took his own son. So they went to California to kill this guy. And um, was that the Lappy? think maybe what's that delappy is that who that is maybe i'm not sure to be honest i, I yeah. don't really know but um they went to california to kill this guy and um they took anthony grado who eventually becomes a, a made guy with the lucchese but they end up shelving anthony grado uh several years later he became a involved became like a drug a heroin addict from what i understand but wow. they went to california to clip this guy and um when they came back the two mafia cops uh, said something to Gas Pipe about the uh, Little Al. Uh, they knew that Little Al did the homicide, and they said Little Al. They were told an informant told some other NYPD, uh, FB, and FBI task force guys that Little Al did this homicide. When word got back. To little Al, to, to Al Diaco, he's now. This is him saying this on the stand. He said, "The only guy that calls me little Al is Bruno Facciolo." <laughs> so when the, when so when the cops, the mafia cops who were dirty, obviously told him the word got back that little Al did this homicide in California. Simply because they used the word little Al, and the only person that called Al Diaco little Al was Bruno, they assumed that Bruno was a rat. So that's and where they got it from. That's where they got the. That's where they wow. got the information that that Bruno was a rat, which he wasn't. Yeah. And they killed. They even stuffed a canary or some bird in his mouth after they killed him. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Crazy, right? That is insane, man. Yeah. And speaking about that pizzeria, that's uh, in Little Al's book uh, with Jerry Capisi. He talks about that pizzeria being the last spot that Tommy D. Simone has seen. Uh, you know, Joe Pesci's character in Goodfellow. That's the last spot. He's at the pizzeria with Bruno Fatiola and uh, I believe Paul Vario's son. And that's kind of the last spot that place that he's ever seen alive. And then 
you know, where he ended up, nobody even knows, but we can only imagine. Well, and you're well, saying they used Bruno and his brother on that. I don't know who actually did the shooting. I don't think <clears throat> I'm not sure if anyone actually knows who did the shooting of Tommy Di Simone. But uh, Bruno's brother was a Gambino guy, yeah, uh, Gambino soldier. And of course, Bruno was a Lucchese soldier. And Tommy Di Simone killed a Gambino guy, so they used him to they used the Gambino Facciolo to negotiate with his brother, how they were going to set up Tommy D. Simone. And, and that's, that's probably why he was at the pizzeria. And that's when they put Yeah. Him. Wow. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Crazy. So one, <laughs> yeah. So one more story you tell, I think it was, I think that you had just taken the police test around 83. Is that correct? No, I came on in 83. I probably took the test in 80 or 81. Okay. So 80 or 81, I think you mentioned that you took the police test, but right before you took it, your friends mentioned that they had a little piece of work that they wanted you to get in on. Yeah. These were like the guys that were involved with the Bruno hit or uh, Bruno incident were like my regular friend, you know, like guys I hung out with all the time. We played football. Okay. Like I said, we played high school football together. I actually grew up with a couple of those guys since kindergarten. Wow. Uh, I knew them at the time already 17 years or uh, whatever, uh, 14 years, 13 years. Um, but this other incident were guys that I knew I didn't hang out with constantly. You know, I would just see them. And uh, one guy, actually, I was pretty close with when we were y- very young. And then actually both of them, when we were young, like uh, 11, 12, 13, I was pretty close with them. Then we kind of went our own way. And um but I would see them occasionally. And I saw them actually one day and they said they were going to do this. Uh, there was a bar in Red Hook and it had Joker, Joker poker machines used to be really big, um, big money makers. And there was a couple of Joker poker machines, uh, some cigarette machines and maybe pinball. I don't remember something else. I think was in there. And um, they were going to, it was, the place was in Red Hook. It was a closed down bar. And they were going to go in there and steal these, these machines for Eddie Lino, who was a Gambino guy. And yeah. I had never seen Eddie Lino, um, but I knew he was a Gambino guy. I knew he was close to John Gotti. Um, and I also knew at the time, none of my friends dealt with drugs, coke or any of that shit. I mean, um, like I said, we all play ball and stuff. So um, none of them. None of us were really into drugs. I was never into drugs at, at all. But I mean, maybe like a couple of them would smoke pot and stuff, but none of my close friends were into coke. But I knew guys that were coke who moved coke. Uh, and it was pretty common knowledge that Eddie Lino was su- supplying yeah. a lot of young guys with coke in Canarsie and they were moving for him. So I knew the name. But in any event, they wanted to, these guys were going to make, make some money going in and, and, and stealing these machines on behalf of Eddie Lino and he was going to pay them to do it. And they asked me if I'd come with them because there was a, a fence in the yard and it was kind of high and they figured I could get over it quick and get in the place and open. And that's what I did. So they had this, uh, they got this van and we, we went over to Red Hook mm-hmm. and um, we went in, into the, I went into the joint. I went, I hopped the fence. I went into a window. I opened the front door for them. They came in. And we all unloaded all these Joker poker machines and cigarette machines into this. Um, it was more of a box truck than a van, actually. Uh, and that's what we did. And then we hooked up with Eddie Lino, who was supposed to pay us to, you know, for the for the for the job we just did, you know. And um, he was an arrogant guy, you know, very cocky, uh, and he didn't really wasn't too happy about paying us, you know. <laughs> Yeah, he, yeah. In fact, he was he was probably looking to sniff us, and um, I was talking. To, and so we had to meet him in the park. We met him in Marina Park with the truck full of stuff. And I thought that was gonna basically. I thought that was the end of it. When we met him there, he was gonna take control of the vehicle with all the stuff in it, and we we're gonna get paid. Well, when we get there. All of a sudden, now the game's going to change. He wanted us to follow him somewhere, and then he said he would pay us. But I, to be honest, I wasn't believing him at this point. In fact, I was kind of angry with my friend for, you know, 
I don't want to say drag him into it, but I thought it was a short thing that we were getting going there and getting paid. And, yeah. Um, now we got to take this stolen stuff somewhere else. And, you know, it was more of a risk than I, I had bargained for. And Eddie, you know, heard me kind of arguing with my friend, so to speak. And he called me over and he was pretty pissed. Like, you know, uh, and I, I, to be honest, I wasn't sure if he was going to swing at me or if he was going to pull his gun out and, and, and shoot me. Because, he, you know, he just had that kind of, uh, you know, belitt belittling attitude. You know, yeah. I mean, we were all kids, obviously, and he was an adult, but he kind of, you know, uh, made you feel like a kid or wanted to make you feel like a kid, you know. Um, and he asked me who I was and where I was from, and he kind of like paid me by throwing like throwing throwing the money at me, like he begrudgingly gave me my money for doing this. Uh, and then I just left. I didn't stay with my friends. I told them, you got you because now they they were a little upset that I got paid and they didn't. And I was like, well, you you guys negotiated this fucking deal, man. You guys, come on. <laughs> and that was it. They took the van wherever they went, and I got to ride home, and that, that was it. Yeah, a guy like that, he's probably like, oh, these guys are probably gangsters in training. They're probably lucky to even, you know, have the opportunity to do a job for me. They should be thankful, you know? That's exactly right. And you know, uh, like, So we, we should be uh, thankful to him for letting us almost get arrested, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And... And again, like Bruno, for those that don't know, you know, Eddie Lino, Gambino guy, massive drug trafficker. Uh, he was said to be one of the shooters on the Castellano hit. And he also gets killed in 1990. More mafia cops stuff, more uh, Louis Epolito, Stephen Caracappa. They they uh, they kill him on the side of the, the Bell Parkway over there. Yeah. So when you so that makes the paper. So you had that interaction with him. So then let's say 10 or more years later, that's in the papers. They even have his picture in the car. What did you think when you saw that? Did you, did you recollect back to that moment? Like, holy crap. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I, even after the incident, I had no guys I had dealings with him. Um, and he had no qualms about being a nasty guy. And, you know, I, I knew guys that had problems, you know, problems with him. Um, and, you know, the, the bottom line is these guys, he'll end up in, for the most part, you end up dead or in jail. So yeah, it really was yeah. no surprise. You know, when it happened, well, obviously nobody knew who did it. You know, they just, I, you know, like I have, I've had friends and people I knew get shot in cars before, and uh, no arrests had, had ever been made. You know, um, so I just figured there were people sitting in the back seat. And he was going somewhere, and you know, his his own, his own people clipped him. You know, but um, yeah. but you know, mafia cops. I did the job obviously crazy so you have that uh growing up a canarsie then and said you in 83 you get on the force yeah. so you 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 end up as a a plain clothes is that correct were you plain clothes right away no no i was in uniform uh, you were in uniform for two years yeah oh, okay yeah that's usually how it works right but you end up on the lower east side right right avenue um, d yeah, Alphabet Alpha City. City. Right. Yeah, when I so when you, I was a rookie, when I used to, I had uh, I was in the same police academy class as a good friend of mine's brother. Um, actually, one of my one of my really good friends' brother. We were in the same class together. So every once in a while, his father would drive us to the police academy. His father was an emergency service cop, um, and he worked out of the third. I think it's the thirteenth precinct where they used to fall out of. Which is the police academy right across, right around the corner from the police academy. So every once in a while, his father would drive us to the police academy, and um, once in a while he'd take a different route, and we'd get off on Houston Street, and take Houston Street to probably First or Third Avenue, and go up to Twentieth Street. Driving down Houston Street, um, you see lines of people lining up like a like a grocery store in in perfect formation, buying heroin. And I wow. asked my friend's father, I'm like, what are, you, are, they, are they seriously just buying drugs like this out in the open? And he was like, yeah, this is Alphabet City. This is, you know, the heroin, basically the heroin capital of the world. And I'm like, how, how the fuck, did, how do pe police don't do anything about this? And at the time, uh, uniform guys weren't allowed to make 
drug collars because of the NAP commission. They put an end to uniform guys making drug collars in fear of um, corruption. Oh, okay. Yeah. They figured wherever there's drugs, there's money. Wherever there's money, there's a possibility of corruption. And uh, so uniform guys weren't, you know, weren't allowed to make drug collars. But after I got on the police force, I wanted to go back to Alphabet City and, you know, I figured, you know, if you want to be an active cop, that's the place to go, you know? And that's what I want. So you wanted, you wanted to be there. That was like, I want to go back. I want to go to Lower East Side. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So 1980s Lower East Side. Give us like a picture because you have. Um, obviously, we could see pictures from them, all the all the buildings, all the the crime. So you have all these gangs there. You have a lot of like Hispanic gangs, a lot of drug traffickers there. You also have like this burgeoning hardcore punk scene going on. You know, at a CBs, you have the punks and the skinheads and they're living in whatever squat that they're living in. And then you got all these gangs. Tell, tell me about how that existence worked between like those sex of people. And, and if yeah. you can give us just like an overall sense of the area at that time. Yeah. So Avenue D, so um, Avenue D runs from Houston street to 14th street and it's Lillian Wolf houses and um, Jacob Priest houses. And the more West you go, the, the the kind of the better it gets. Um, Avenue A was where a lot of the punk stuff was, and they was the punk guys and the punk rockers and First Avenue CBGBs. I think was on Second or Third Avenue. But when they wanted to score their dope, they go to Avenue D. Um, okay. Now, the, they weren't really gangs like we know it today. I mean, because the the bottom line was they were making these kids, and they were young. I mean, sometimes they're actually on YouTube. A lot of these are. Uh, like if you Google Alphabet City, 1980s, there's a couple of YouTube music, like guy, a guy put a bunch of photos together, put music to it, and they're pretty cool. Uh, you know, well, it's, it's nostalgic for me because I recognize all the kids in these photos. And they wow. were in their 20s. And to me now, they look like kids, but the fact of the matter was, was I, I was a kid also. I mean, I was in my tw early 20s. And um, these guys, they... They wouldn't, it wasn't like gang against gang. They were making literally, literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a month. Um, wow. So there was no need. The only time somebody would get shot is if somebody maybe stole somebody's dope or they, you know, they stepped off with somebody's dope or, um, but for the most part, they lived uh, in existence pretty well on the, on the basically one major drug dealer who um, eventually has a guy flip against him. And the guy who flips against the main guy who control all of Alphabet City uh, ha actually had been a, a, a tax accountant uh, who became a heroin addict. And he did this guy's books for him. He did all his drug records and very wow. meticulous, except he had a heroin addict, heroin problem. Um, in the books, he, in his notes, he, he figured that this guy, and he actually admits to it, the drug, the main drug guy, making $101,000 per day wow. just from the heroin addict, on, just from the heroin he moved on low east side. $101,000 $101, per day. He was involved in um, over 100 homicides. He personally, personally killed 19 people. And now, is this the guy you refer to as Davey Blue Eyes? Is that that guy? Yeah. Is that his real name or is that a name you used for the book? No, is that it's how similar it... to what his name was actually. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. he admitted to $101,000 per day and being having a taking part in some way in over 100 homicides. Wow. So uh, these guys weren't just making, you know, that's why so many of these, you know, you see these, uh, some of these young wannabe wise guys moving drugs and thinking they're making money. I mean, these kids. Yeah. Are, I mean, yeah, they're making shit compared to what these guys were making. You know, right. you know? even the underlings were making, like I said, hundreds of thousands of dollars per per month. You know, crazy, crazy. unbelievable. So you're on Avenue D where you're working now. A, B, C, and D they all have like a name associated with it, right? Like A is adventurous, B is bold, C is crazy, yeah. D is dead. Right? Is yeah. that what it is? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you, <laughs> so you're working yeah. in. And dead Avenue D. So what what is like every day you go to work? 
explain, you know, talk to me about well, that. You're, you're a narcotics um, officer and you go into Deadville. What is that like? Well, I was in a unit called Operation 8. And okay. Operation 8 was a federally funded, the government paid our overtime, it paid for our vehicle. Um, and it was a kind of a prestigious unit. So there was only four cops in it and one sergeant. And we would go down there and we'd work. Like, you know, we'd pick off dealers and buyers and we made a lot of calls, a lot of arrests, drug calls, gun calls. Um, and and I had one particular partner who I work with all the time. And we were he was only a year older than me. He grew up in Flatbush. I grew up in Canarsie, so we were almost neighbors growing up. Um, so really going to work every day was like going to hang out with your best friend. It really was. Yeah. And it was it was a great, you know. First of all, um, it was always something going. We used to call it the volcano because you could be doing almost nothing, and then shit would hit the fan in a matter of seconds. Either a homicide or a shooting, or you know, um, and and you could be as busy as you want. If you want to make an arrest every day, you can make an arrest, a drug arrest. You know, and I'm not talking a minor drug arrest. I'm talking about a substantial heroin arrest. You can make a, yeah. a big drug arrest almost every day, um, and if you wanted to relax one day. You can hang out, you know, like, like I said, the drug dealers were, were young. There was a hundred, there was a thousand girls in the area, in the projects. Um, it was, like I said, it was like going to work, kind of like going to work with your best friend, you know? What would you say would be like the scariest being a narcotics officer in the Lower East Side in the 80s? What, what would be like the scariest situation? Like, let's say you get called to a building and you know, it's some kind of squat or something. And, and, you know, you got, you don't know what's going on in there. Would that be something that would kind of be one of the more scary situations you think for yourself at that um, time? Yeah. I mean, you know, you could be working with your pawn and you get called to a, a shots fired and you run yeah. there and there are people shooting. So oh, you know, active, you get to the yeah. scene, there's an active shooting going on. You know, you got to take cover. You got to, you know, uh, uh, address the situation and, you know, try to subdue the, the, the guy shooting. You know, that was common. Uh, assaults in progress were common. Guys knifing each, you know, pulling knives on each other and you get to the scene. And people think, you know, I talk about it in my book. People think when you pull your gun and you say, police don't move, that the guy actually says, okay, I'm not going to move. <laughs> yeah. Because you go fuck yourself. What are you going to do? Yeah. Gotta put your, yeah. Either shoot him or put your gun back. And you know, put your hands on. It. <laughs> so when you were a cop, um, were you still living in Brooklyn at that time? I was. I was still in Canarsie. Yep. Yeah. And you're still in Canarsie, huh? Wow. Yeah. And you said something in the book that I liked. Also, you said I might be messing this quote up, but you said there's two types of families in Canarsie. I think you said a wolf family and then a sheepdog family. Is am I correct? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Can yeah. you can you can you tell us what you mean by that? Yeah, it's like in the, a lot of guys, you know, the younger people probably won't understand it, but the cartoons years ago, uh, um, I can't think of the name of the, co the actual cartoon character, but he, one would be a sheepdog and the other one was a wolf. And they say good morning to each other, uh, smile at each other, then they punch like a, a time clock in as if they're going to work. Yeah. And once they punch in, then they, they know they're no longer friends, you know. The, the right. sheep becomes, goes to the sheep the wolf becomes a wolf and then at the end of the day five o'clock they walk back and punch out and they become friends again and that's really how Kanasi was you had a yeah. shitload of mobsters and then you also had a shitload of uh, civil service workers you know legit people and they live right you know literally right next to each other yeah well wow. yeah. couldn't avoid it I guess yeah wow so how long were you working in the Lower East Side? Because I believe you said you did move away from there at some point. How long were you in the Lower East Side on Avenue D? Um, I was on Avenue D from about 1984 to like 91. Um, wow. Probably in like 1988 or 89, we, hooked, we, we joined forces with the DEA, me and my partner. What happened was the DEA was doing a, a big case on some major heroin violators, and they didn't have enough information about them. They they knew some some information, but not enough. Well, they had spoke to another DEA agent that we used to help out with cases once in a while, and he said, "Well, if you have anything on Alphabet City, any 
you know, perps down there, any criminals down there, go see these two guys, me, me and my partner. Because we knew every, you know, at that point we had worked down there six years and we were there, Alphabet City, every day, literally every day. Uh, these guys couldn't put a brand of dope, like, you know, they, they stamped their dope. I don't know if they yeah. still do that in, in other places, but uh, Alphabet City used to stamp their dope. So if you got high and you liked it, you would go looking for that brand. And these guys would stamp a brand of dope or change the name. And we literally know, knew who was behind the, that brand. Oh, wow. Because you know, we had so many informants that wanted to ingratiate themselves with us that they would want, you know, they want us to like them and maybe not look to arrest them. And so they'd come and give us information. And I mean, literally, we'd meet, we'd meet these guys on the roof landing, or on the roof. We'd have one informant come up, we'd send him down one way, and we'd have another one come up. I mean, that's, it, it was, it, it's, you wouldn't believe it. It was incredible. You talk about, <clears throat> like, rats and informants and, well, they were riding on each other like crazy because they all wanted to be on our good side. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> confidential informant, certainly a, an important part of your job back then. And these weren't registered because to use a registered informant, they can't be on parole. They can't be on probation. They can't have an active uh, warrant. They can't be 50 <laughs> that you couldn't use them. So who they want to see was Boy Scouts, and th there weren't any Boy Scouts selling drugs. Right, so right. We would just pay them out of our own pocket, really. And which you wow. Know, or we'd let them open. Like So one of them would want to, he'd ask, can I, deal, can I, can I go out there and not, you guys not bother me today? And we're like, yeah, okay. That don't mean we told other cops not to bother them, but we wouldn't bother them. Like we would just <laughs> go. You want to work? Go. We, we, you know, go go on another corner, and we won't bother you. And so yeah. that's how we would, you know, let them do their thing, and then come back with information for us. Yeah, and for the most part, these were these were the smaller guys. I imagine these were just like the neighborhood knuckleheads, just trying to get a piece of the action. You know, they weren't really like right. the Davy Blue Eyes character types. <laughs> Right. They were removed from Davy by one or two levels, but they right. knew enough. Like, so in other words, very often what they would do is they would know who would be running the dope down from the projects, let's say, who would be carrying 400, 500 bags. And they would tell us, so-and-so is going to be coming out of the building. He's wearing a, a red jacket. He's got, he's going to be carrying five packages. Okay. And we grab him, sure as hell, he's got 500 bags of dope on him. And then we let this guy do his own thing for, you know, and we'd, we'd have to be off the street anyway doing doing the paperwork, the arrest papers. Yeah. Yeah. So he thinks we're not bothering him, but we're off the street anyway because we got this college, you know? So that's the way it worked most of the time for us. And you got the nickname Rambo on the streets. Is that right? I did. They called <laughs> yeah. you Rambo? Yeah. Wow, that, yeah. How'd that start? You know, I, I'll tell you, because um, I, we chased – these two guys came from Jersey to, to cop a big – uh, a lot of dope one day, a couple of packages of dope, and the one guy ran from us. Um, but most of the people that knew us wouldn't run from us because they knew we'd catch them eventually, you know, we'd see them every day. But when you're from Jersey, they didn't know us, they didn't know we were always there and we were always around. But he ran from us. Now, I could have very easily let him run because I wasn't, I didn't need that arrest terribly. But um, the other dealers were watching. So I couldn't let this guy run and not catch him. So I chased him. And then when, when he got tired, he actually turned around and picked up his hands and wanted to fight because he, you know, he knew he wasn't going to run anymore. He just wanted to fight. And he stops right, literally right in front of the, the drug dealers that we knew. So it became, you know, a fight, you know, a fight for me to arrest this guy. And really I'm only fighting for the rest and he's fighting for his life because he knows if he gets arrested, he's going to jail for a long time. Yeah. Know? But um, it became a fight that, you know, I had to chase him. I jumped over a fence and this and that. And that's what, you know, <laughs> why I caught him. That's why they call me Rambo, you know? You started calling you Rambo. Wow. Yeah. So Rambo's coming when they see you on the on the beat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wow. So eventually you leave the Lower East Side. Uh, I think you said you ended up in Harlem for a little bit. Is that correct? We ended up in Harlem for a short time. What happened was um, there was a bank robbery up in um, 
the Upper East Side or Upper West. I think the Upper East Side was a bank robbery, or maybe Midtown. And the FBI, whenever there's a bank robbery, the FBI is involved. And the FBI was debriefing an informant, somebody who knew some information about this particular bank robbery. <clears throat> and um, in the process of that, giving information about the bank robbery, or maybe he, when he was finished, he said, oh, by the way, there's two cops on the Lower East Side, Babyface and Rambo, that's me and my partner. He said, and there's a contract on uh, So it was a contract was, on your head. Be fifty thousand for my for, for me and fifty thousand for my partner. Wow. And he and he gave and he said who put the contract out and Dave Davy Boys was one of the guys and a couple of his underlings put the money in and put this contract out. The problem was they didn't have an easy time getting somebody to take the contract because nobody wants to kill two cops. You know, it's not easy. It's a hard target. You know, um, but. When they found that out, they had to notify my department and they notified the chief and the chief took us out of Alphabet City, kind of like a temporary thing until he felt uh, things could cool off and uh, until the detectives had a chance to talk to the guys who put the contract out and tell them, look, we know what's going on. Um, so he moved us up to Harlem in plain clothes. He gave us a special car. The chief gave us his own car. And he said, just go up here. Don't do anything. Just chill out. And literally, the first or second day we were up there, we see one of the dealers from the Lower East Side had a spot up at home. And he saw us anyway. So it really it didn't, to be honest, it didn't even matter that they moved us. If they wanted to hit us, you know, wow. they could it anyway. But like I said, it's a, nobody wants to take the contract. No. So, before we move on, I just want to go back to something a couple of guys we spoke about before, uh, Louis Epolito and Stephen Caracappa. Now, did you know anybody that knew those guys? We're talking about the mafia cops. Did you know anyone that knew those guys or did you have any run-ins with them? I know they were they maybe were in a different area. Did yeah, you, you know, have any? It's a, it's a small world. My partner uh, had gotten stabbed uh, off duty. Wow. And, and Louis Caracappa. Well, first of all, I worked with Caracappa's brother, who was a lieutenant in, okay. in the detective bureau. Wow. Um, I didn't work with him steady, but I knew him and we worked together once in a while. His brother was a sharp detective, uh, a decent guy and a sharp detective. Um, Louis Epolito, when my partner got stabbed off duty, um, Louis Epolito caught the case. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and I didn't know him at the time. I, I, I never heard of him. I didn't know him, but he was another kind of arrogant guy, you know, um, really arrogant guy. I, obviously, like I said, I didn't know what he was up to. I didn't have any, any information on him, but eventually oh, yeah. they, they eventually make the arrest on this guy that stayed my partner, but they lost the case. They lost the trial. So the guy okay. walked free. Yeah. Um, but anyway, that was my only interaction with him. And, um, and like I said, uh, Caracappa's brother, I know. So his brother was, uh, his brother was a detective, Caracappa's? Detective, detective Lieutenant. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, wow. Sharp guy, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wild stuff. So you retire and you did 20 years, right? Right. 2003, I got out. I came on in 83. I left in 2003. So what was what title did you end up retiring with? What was your final position in, in the law enforcement? Uh, detective sergeant. Detective sergeant. All right. And yeah. where did you end your career? Um, I retired out of, I don't think it exists anymore, but it was called, a, it was a secret service task force. And I was a supervisor for the West African task force um, and the electronic crime task force. We didn't do any, even though it was secret service, me and my detectives didn't do any uh, protection. We just worked cases, electronic okay. crime cases, uh, Nigerian Nigerian uh, bank fraud and Nigerian uh, bank uh, cases, uh, robbery cases. Uh, it was actually a pretty good, you know, it was a pretty decent unit. So electronic crimes, that's like, um, well, that's like credit card stuff, banking stuff, it was scamming and stuff, stuff like that. Some, uh, yeah, some uh, uh Fraud stuff, some uh, counterfeit stuff, yeah, yeah. Because uh, 
Secret Service used to be part of Treasury. So a lot of financial, you know, financial stuff. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I want to talk about, so, I mean, even what we spoke about, you know, growing up in Canarsie, becoming a cop on the Lower East Side. I mean, you have quite a life, uh, Mike. I want to talk about when you got into jujitsu, if you don't mind, because, you know, you're a, you're a third degree under Henzo. So to be a third degree under Henzo, I imagine that you've been training at least 25 years or, you know, yeah, I would. Just about, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I'm a blue belt under a Henzo school. You know, I got to get my ass yeah. back. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Henzo Gracie, he was uh, here in Bayside in Queens. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the guy that opened it was uh, Mike Jaramillo. You know him? Oh, I know Mike. And Doug Pelinkovic. Those were the guys that opened that school. Um, so I got my blue belt there. And then COVID happened. Everything got shut down. And I feel like a fat loser, but I haven't been back training since. But I, but I, <laughs> but I did get my blue belt, and I plan on going back, man. It changed my life, man. It got me in amazing shape, and it was, you know, one of the best experiences I've had so far. So I hope Thank to get you. back. Yeah, I hope to get back soon. But I want to know about your jujitsu journey because getting into it when you did, it wasn't like oh, everyone's doing jujitsu, you know. Um. Well, I went to Brazil when I was actually when I was still working in in a. With the DEA, with uh, my partner and I were in the DEA, and I went to Brazil on vacation, uh, knowing that the Gracies were there, you know, and I got to train yeah. over at Baja in Rio, um, and so that was my first taste, and that was probably like 1989, um, but there weren't any schools here in New York, you right. know, and um, I think Henzo, Henzo had a school in Philadelphia, but obviously I, I couldn't go to Philadelphia. And then I, I started training uh, with a guy named Fabio Clemente on 14th Street in Manhattan. But I knew Henzo was in the area somewhere. But this is going back to like the early, like 1993, let's say 94. Um, and it took me a long time to find him. Anyway, I, I eventually find him probably like 97, 98, when he opened the school. He was using a Chinese school as a... Uh, he I was a Chinese school, Kung Fu school, and he would use it a few days a week. And if somebody told me it was on 27th Street or 28th Street. And again, there was no internet. There was He wasn't in the yellow pages. I couldn't find him. So what I did was I uh, I got in the police car and I drove up, I don't know if it was 27th or 28th. I always get confused, but I drove from, one, from the east side all the way to the west side. And every martial arts school that was there, I rang their bell and I said, does Henzo ever teach here? And uh, of course, some people got me, some of the instructors got mad at me. Some didn't know what I was talking about. And then when I <laughs> when it was Sixth and Seventh Avenue, I rang a Kung Fu school, and I said, "Is Hansel Gracie teach here?" And it was a little old Chinese lady, and she said, "Yeah, he's here. Um, I think he was there. I know he was there on Saturday mornings, and I think maybe Thursday nights." And she told me, "Yeah, he's here Saturday mornings." And then that's how I found him. And that, again, was like in uh, maybe ninety six or ninety seven, something like that. Now, was that a spot? I heard it was like a dingy upstairs uh, spot or something like that. Was no, that... His, first, his first academy, so he was there for a few years, and he also taught out in New Jersey at the back of the gym. So okay, Saturdays I would train in the city of Manhattan. Sundays I would go out to Jersey. And then um, a couple of years later, maybe like maybe like 99 or 2000, he opened up uh, a school on West, uh, West 37th Street. On top of a uh, methadone clinic. Oh my um, god! <laughs> it was a methadone clinic, and it was also a like a like a mental health clinic for trans transsexuals. Wow! So, so you walk into the elevator, <laughs> and you didn't know what you were gonna get when you walked into the elevator. And outside the place was all the junkies that were either on methadone or trying to steal methadone or heroin addicts switching dope for methadone. That, it was great. Just the area itself was a, a, was a horror. And then you go in this building, uh, like I said, you go in the elevator, you didn't know what you didn't know what you were going to get when, when you got in the elevator. Uh, and then, you know, you hit, I think we were on maybe like the fourth floor, or fifth floor, and then you get up, you hit the elevator, you get off, and it was the Henzo Academy. Wow. And that would have been like when Matt Sarah would have been there at that time, I imagine, training. Yep, Matt Sarah would like teach sometimes in yeah. the morning. 
um, Sean Williams, John Danaher. John Danaher, yeah. Yeah, all them guys were. But Danaher, when I first when I got there, I think Danaher was maybe just getting his purple belt. Sean Williams, the same thing. Matt Serra, I think might have. I think he was a purple belt too. I was there when Matt yeah. got his black belt, but um, I think he, I think they were all purple belts when I got there. Wow, wow, Danaher is what he became is amazing. Yeah. Um. So after that, um, so when do you get your black belt? How long is that journey to get your black belt? Um, 2007, I got my black belt. 2007. Oh, so so about 10 years or so. Yeah, yeah, just from about, yeah. from training with Henzo. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's crazy because, like we were saying before, in the '90s, you know, it wasn't like jujitsu was all over the place. I mean, you had to literally go and ring those bells and go everywhere. And there's a documentary you've probably seen. I think it's called. I don't recall. It was about the California scene, uh, maybe in the late '80s, early '90s, and you had these guys working out in garages with like the Gracies that came over, and you know, it was it was just all word of mouth. You just had to go out of your way to to find this thing. Yeah, it was uh, like I, like like I said, I couldn't find him. You know, uh, I was training on 14th Street, and I knew Henzo was in the area, but I couldn't. You know, guys didn't know where Alan was either. You know, it was wow. crazy. Then, well, like I said, he wasn't in the yellow pages because it wasn't his school, and there was no internet, so he was yeah. all, you know hard to find. And now you have your own school, is that correct? I do. I have a school out in uh, here in Staten Island. What's the name of that school? Uh, Cadell Academy. Cadell Academy. Okay. Yeah. Really cool. I got a, really cool, man. I got an Instagram page with the same, uh, with the same name, Cadell Academy. At Cadell Academy. So you've had an interesting life, Mike. I want to ask you before you know we 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 end this and soon. If you could take one lesson that you learned from growing up in Canarsie, and then maybe one lesson that you learned from being a cop, what what would that what would, what would those lessons be? Um. You know, <clears throat> I think in general, um, there's, there, there comes a time when, when you have to, you know, you have to make a decision. You have to define yourself if you're going to go this, make a right turn or a left turn. And um, like as a kid with that any Leno story, you know, I was face to face with him. I took like a little side stance. So I really thought he was going to smack me, to be honest. And I didn't want to stand there with my hand. I wasn't going to hit him back, but I wasn't going to stand there and just take a hard shot. I, I gave him a little bit of an angle. Um, and even when I when I gave him through the money in my hand and I walked away, I felt like he could have, he, he was the kind of guy in my head that might have shot me in the back of the head. Yeah. And literally, that kind of made me feel like you got to make a decision. Do you want to live this kind of life? Um, not being able to trust your friends. Like, like I said, in the other incident with Bruno, somebody gave up all my friends. I think I know which one of them did. You didn't want to be to save himself. He gave up everybody else. So do you want to not be able to trust your friends, not be able to sleep at night, possibly end up in jail? Um, you have to make it at some point. You have to make a decision. You know, which way you want to, which way you want to go. That, that's, I think that was a lesson I learned as a kid. And, and I guess the lesson I learned is as a cop, and I learned it later on, I, the more, the older or more experienced I became a cop is, um, and really it sounds kind of cliche, but I kind of feel honestly that there before the grace of God could go any one of us. Because these kids that were not so much the dealers, because they were in it for the money, you know, um, but these users, these heroin users, they just made a mistake. Like the mistake yeah. that I made Robbing this fucking robbing this store. Um, I could easily have got arrested that night. And then who knows down the road, you know, I might have ended up getting hooked up with dope or getting hooked up on junk. And you know, so really it, it only takes a few mistakes to change your life. And really, I, as an adult, as a cop, um, uh, I kind of got a little bit sympathetic towards a lot of these users more than the dealers, but you know, there before the grace of God could be anybody, man. Anybody can make the mistake. And slip and fall, you know? Yeah. Well, you make that right choice. You become a cop. I mean, you know, that's dangerous in itself, of course, you know, to get involved in a certain lifestyle that you could have in Canarsie. But then it's still dangerous being a cop in the Lower East Side. And then you go into the jujitsu journey, which 
to get to where you are. I mean, I can't even imagine. I mean, it's a lot of, I imagine it's a lot of pain. It's a lot of perseverance. It's a lot of injuries. So you seem like a guy, man. You, you I don't know. You crave a little danger in, in your life. Maybe there's something about you. You definitely have a little, <laughs> a little of that in you for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, a little excitement makes a, makes a day go fast. Excitement. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So Mike, can you talk about your book? Just plug your book, uh, Alphaville. And yeah, um, tell um, us. Here it is. Let me see. I don't know if, can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to put it up too. Yeah. That's the book. Um, it's actually, been, it was actually option for film a couple of times. Robert De Niro and Showtime had bought it. I can uh, see that, man. Yeah. They bought it a couple of years ago and now it's actually being shopped around as a, uh, uh, as a docu-series. Um, and then, uh, some people actually from Showtime recently, actually a, a pretty cool, uh, production company wanted to make, was actually in negotiations or in talks to make it a TV series for Showtime. And then, um, it's kind of on hold right now, but yeah, it was, it's, a, it's an interesting book. It was a lot of fun doing it, you know? Made, yeah, I, yeah. And I hope that happens, man. I really, I really hope that that, that comes to fruition. And maybe not might it might not happen now, but the, the story's not gonna die. I mean, someone someone's gonna do something with it, man. It's, it's, and I really suggest everyone get the book. You can get it on Amazon, you can get it on Audible, or I don't know if you have a site that you prefer to to get it or not. Okay. Yeah, I'm an audible guy. Yeah. So I got it there on Audible. You guys can get it there. I'll put links into this video as well so people can find it. You also have a YouTube, so you can plug that, talk about that. I do. I saw the YouTube um couple uh, not too long ago and it's uh mike cadella up against the wall and i talk about some of the stories in the book um some other stories i left a lot of stuff out of the book um and it's kind of fun doing you know i get a lot of questions guys ask me questions or comments and uh, you know i like i enjoy answering their questions you know it's kind of kind of cool i get a kick out of it yeah so mike cadella up against the wall i would appreciate yeah. it you know you guys my subs you can guys can go over there and please subscribe and, you know, like and subscribe to Mike's channel. And he definitely deserves it. And um, he's got some great stories. Mike, I really appreciate you doing this. Uh, we met. Well, we didn't meet. I mean, I kind of got um, introduced to who you were through Manny Grossman. I know you yeah. know Manny with the Son of Sam stuff. Yeah. yeah. I know he, <laughs> Manny's a great guy. So, uh, yeah. So that's how I kind of found you. And then I read the book and I was like, oh, man, this guy is growing up around the stuff that I talk about that I can only, you know, pretend to imagine what it was like, you know? So yeah, I love, anytime I, I could, you, I love the stuff you post, man. Uh, you know, you put up. Thank we're, you. Man. Really it's my neighborhood or some other neighborhood. It's actually really cool, man. Really good stuff. I, get I appreciate it, man. Yeah. I really appreciate it. I know people want to see this stuff. People want to hear the stories. Oh, one more thing, man. I hope I'm not keeping you, but no, no, speaking no. of speaking of stuff I did, I did a story um, about some, about a guy out of Canarsie, and then I followed that up with an interview uh, with a tattoo artist. And the story of the guy I did was a guy named Crazy Sal DeSarno. I did a little story on that. I don't know if you saw that. but uh, oh, I Yeah, I did, actually. I saw it. He's in yeah, my book. I, oh. Is he? Yeah. Is yeah. he in your book? He is. I mentioned him uh, because I knew Sledge. I, I didn't know him. Oh, that's right. That's right. You mentioned, but you you kind of didn't like him. Am I, am I correct in that assumption? Was was he hard, kinda... I mean, listen, I was a hard, you know. He, you know, Kanasi kids were tough, but they weren't all bad. And he kind of had a all bad attitude, like you know. Yeah. But anyway, he was doing his job, I guess. But um, crazy Sal, I went to school with like one of his, I guess you'd call him a hanger on. This kid idolized okay. crazy Sal. He was my age, and he fucking idolized like who, like he thought crazy Sal was God. He even got the same tattoo. What do you have on his chest? Sal had something on his chest or yeah so he had a uh it was done by a guy by the name of tony Polito, who was pretty much the only game in town back then for tattoos in brooklyn especially it was uh the cowboy the skull head with the cowboy hat it was right on right. his chest right. and uh, that tattoo has since taken off i mean some people even call it the crazy sal people that live you know in japan and england they're getting this tattoo they're calling it the crazy sal wow. which is which I'm sure to you hearing that is insane because, yeah. Well, this kid, I, I'm not sure if it was that tattoo, but it might have been. But he came in, you know, back, I was in high school with him. I think he was my age or maybe a year younger than me. 
Um, so that made him like 15 or 16. And he came to school one day with a big tattoo. And he said, yeah, it's the same one Sal got. So now I don't remember what tattoo it was. I just remember this young kid, especially back in the 80s. No, but kids didn't have tattoos, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, he definitely got it from the same guy. I, I, would, I would bet on that. Definitely Tony Polito probably did that. Yeah, that's, man, what a place to grow up, huh, Mike? Yeah, it was crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a crazy place. But you know what? It's really strange because <clears throat> what, I, but people don't, what doesn't exist now, at least I don't see it. Like, so my, my father grew up with those kids that I grew up, those kids that I hung out with. My father knew their father growing up. Yeah. Uh, I could go to any part of Canarsie, and if I was in trouble, somebody there would know, maybe not me, but would know my last name because my father yeah. was there and his brother, his brothers. And, you know, um, so Canar like people, they, they, you know, they got there, let's say, in the 40s or 30s and 40s. Then they raised their kids in the same neighborhood. Yeah. So everybody knew, you know, like even the bad guys, like like I said, Vicar Muso, he knew my uncle. Um, he's got nephews that I, I know, you know, I know who they are. Uh, so everybody kind of knew everybody, you know what I mean? Which really yeah. doesn't exist anymore. Now everybody closes their door. They don't know who their neighbor is or you go down the yeah. block. No it's a whole different Yeah, world. be honest. I mean, I probably, maybe I know like two people on my block, you know? Right. God forbid my doorbell rings. I'm like, who the hell is, <laughs> the right. fuck is ringing my bell? <laughs> exactly. You know? Right. So right. it's, it's a, it's definitely, uh, you know, I didn't, I grew up, you know, I was born in like the late, I was born in 86. So, you know, I missed, I missed all that stuff. But, um, but I love to, I love to hear about it. I love to speak, speaking to guys like you. And I hope to find, uh, more Canarsie people, more Brooklyn people from back then to speak to, and um, probably want to have your uh, qualifications, your your career. But you know, everybody's got a story, right? Absolutely, man. Everybody's yeah. got a story for sure. All right, Mike. I really appreciate this, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put this on on my channel. Is there anything else you would like to say before before we go? No, that's it, man. Really, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'll continue watching your your, your channel. Like Thank said, you. And uh, that's it, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. All, All right. right. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you, buddy. Bye. Bye.